Hello, my name is Dr. Anthony Chang. I'm the Chief Intelligence and Innovation Officer at Children's Hospital Orange County with a uh, interest in artificial intelligence and you are watching Facets TV. I'm Erin Runyon and you're watching Facets Television. <laughs> Welcome to Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with us today is Dr. Anthony Chang. Dr. Chang is the Chief Innovation and Intelligence Officer for the Children's Hospital of Orange County, otherwise known to most of us here as Chalk. He's also heading up a conference called AI Med coming up later this year. Thank you so much for coming in, Dr. Chang. Thanks for having me back, Kevin. Yeah, it's really good to see you. Yeah, it's been a fast year. It sure has. So. Um, I attended the conference and I just want to talk quickly about what's coming for the new year and um, have you kind of go over what was most exciting about the last event. Well, um, since last year a lot is happening and continues to happen at an exponential pace and um, last year we had a lot of discussion about the hottest method in artificial intelligence which is deep learning. You heard about the Google uh, AlphaGo software being the human Go champion uh, earlier this year. So that's been uh, a focus for adopting that strategy for medicine, which is not easy mm -hmm. uh, because it's very, very sophisticated. So we're looking for sort of the ideal partnership between the computer and the human to make, as I say, every doctor a Sherlock Holmes. Um, so that's one uh, uh, sort of trend that's continuing. In addition to that, there are lots of uh, new dimensions to artificial intelligence that's really hot right now. One is um, virtual and augmented reality. Okay. So um, uh, everything is going virtual, including medical education um, and patient experiences. Explaining, can you imagine a surgeon explaining to, this, to the patient the surgery that he or she's about to perform using augmented or virtual reality. And so actually basically, be able to demonstrate it. Right, right literally walking yeah. through the patient through the procedure. That's fantastic. Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, there's also a lot of excitement about 3D printing. So mm -hmm. 3D printing requires a lot of artificial intelligence to write the program and to manipulate the program so that every patient will get a individualized approach to a surgical or any kind of procedure. And lastly, it's exciting to see all the sensors out there. We've talked about the Internet of Everything and mm -hmm. Internet of Things, IoT and IOE. And that is going to require artificial intelligence to sort of uh, be the traffic cop for all the signals that are coming in to... Well, and to patients. analyze the results, right? I mean, the, right. the idea is that you're going to have this immense amount of information that without artificial intelligence and machine learning, what would it mean? Right. What, what so, could it do for you? Right. right. So having uh, an intelligent virtual assistant or virtual doctor even mm -hmm. uh, in, in the form of an avatar um, for a, a sort of a chat bot uh, experience so that in the future, as we were talking about just in the hallway, uh, for clinical depression or uh, anyone that's at risk for suicide, for instance, you can have a virtual assistant talking the patient through a difficult time that is intelligent. So you don't want some uh, a robot that's just talking back in an algorithm. You want right. actually a creative conversation. So within this decade, we'll have a chatbot that's smart enough to talk to you like a, a real person. So they had that, uh, the challenge, I believe it was Google, that had to turn off its chatbot because it was creating <laughs> its own language, right? Right. And, and it was finding ways to shortcut or more efficiently speak than English, which yes. I found to be really interesting. And they ended up having to turn it off because they couldn't understand what the AI understood, even yeah. though the results were accurate. Well, sometimes, um, as in this case, the technology of artificial intelligence, as in other technologies, sort of leaping ahead of what humans can think the technology can mm -hmm. do. And also, obviously, uh, also in terms of ethics and um, yeah. the resources that's required to do something like this. So, so from that perspective, um, artificial intelligence in medicine, um, I wrote an article recently on the, the dangers of integration into the human mind, but where do you think the best benefit is going to be long term? I mean, where do you see AI in medicine being the most powerful? Well, as I think exciting as deep learning and virtual reality and chatbots are in medicine, I think the biggest gain for medicine for artificial intelligence is something actually pretty mundane, which is 
getting data to flow through the healthcare system mm -hmm. used efficiently and without duplication, without misinterpretation. So um, I just came from a family meeting just prior to this interview of a family with a child that's very complicated. It wouldn't be wonderful if all the information is funneled through so that we have maximum use of the data without a lot of duplication of tests. And, right. You know, um, where trying results to, are recognized. We're trying to find any patient's information from different subspecialists and, and laboratories are still uh, a very, very big enigma and conundrum in healthcare. So I actually see the biggest gain in healthcare is just stream, streamlining all that data and mm -hmm. information very efficiently for the doctors to understand. So I think the, um, the thing that's fascinated me the most, and if you could comment on it, is the combined intelligence idea, the whole concept that you have one specialist can only have the experience that that specialist has, but if you take a thousand specialists that have all inputted their commentary into a system that then can go, hey, these five things are the same, and by the way, that might be an answer. To me, that's exciting. That's yeah, it's uh, basically a concept of a collective superintelligence so yeah. that uh, hopefully a computer in the future will be the smartest doctor on the planet. Uh, with all the human doctors contributing to a network, that will give us the best answer to all the questions that we might have. Sort of not very different than um, for those of us who watched Star Trek in the 60s and mm -hmm. 70s when Captain Kirk used to, an to ask the, the ship computer a, a, any question and the ship computer could answer back. Right. So we're looking for that. But on the other hand, we still want the human clinician to be involved. Absolutely. Um, and I, that's why I kind of compare this to you know, the Sherlock Holmes uh, detective stories where Watson will come in, ironically it was Dr. Watson, will come in with some facts. Yeah. But it took Sherlock Holmes to kind of interpret it in Put a different way to yeah. solve a very difficult case. So I see this as, again, the, the machine learning and the deep learning computer working with the human clinician that understands the limitations mm -hmm. and the nuances of the computer to affect a great synergy. And, to, and, and I think also to both check the decision making as well yep. as I, I think the subtleties of human thought um, were a long ways away from any system being able to mimic Correct. that epiphany yeah. that comes yeah. from life's experience, right? Yeah, I think the sooner that doctors and the data scientists work together and, 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 and in a close fashion, the better. So uh, we're going to be heading into this um, segment. We've got a series of shows from AI Med that people are going to be able to watch. Um, for those that haven't attended, what, what type of an experience will they have if they attend AI Med? Well, um, we're particularly excited about this year is uh, um, sort of backed by popular demand. Um, we're expecting well over 500 clinicians and data scientists from all around the world. Fantastic. There seems to be a clarion call for all of us that are interested in leveraging the technologies of AI in its many, many facets for healthcare and uh, medicine. And I think it ranges from, as I said, mundane things like getting chatbots and algorithms to solve the conundrum in healthcare, getting data to go from one place to another, to sort of the new um, areas in 3D printing and virtual reality. So it's going to be, I think, even more exciting than last year when we were mainly focused on machine learning and deep learning. Well, I can't wait for the audience to have an opportunity to see that series, and, and I really want to thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy Thanks. man. <laughs> And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. I hope you'll come back. Yes, anytime you ask me. Fantastic. You've been watching Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with us this evening is Dr. Anthony Chang. He is the Chief Innovation and Intelligence Officer at Children's Hospital of Orange County. Thanks for watching. <laughs>
Welcome to Ion Business Innovation. Today's topic is women in entrepreneurship. I have with me Dr. Deb Ferber. Deb, welcome to the show again. Um, let's talk about women in entrepreneurship. It looks like uh, we don't have quite the same level playing field that we hoped we'd have, that uh, we've got far more men entrepreneurs than women. Why is that and what can we do about it? Boy, I was just in your class recently and I was reflecting on how things have gotten better, but they sure could go a lot faster in my opinion. Okay. But I think uh, women are still struggling um, because, again, the VC um, folks are looking at companies that grow beyond $10 million. And we're still okay. seeing that struggle where women are, are capping out at $10 million. Okay. And it's difficult to get venture funding versus angel funding if that's kind of your threshold. Well, when I started to prepare for the class, one of the things I did was I asked some college-age women, you know, why do you think there's this differential? And they had an answer I wasn't prepared for. They said, well, as children... Um, the, the girls uh, get reinforced differently than the boys do for taking risk. Right. And I never really considered that, that, you know, if you're the son, you know, go out there and take risks and, you know, let's go ahead to start your own business. Whereas with women, well, you know, you maybe want to play a little more safe. Do you find that to be the case or is that? Absolutely. So the good news is uh, the new generation, we've got more team sports. Yeah, okay. Women are doing team sports, so they're learning uh, to interact and be more assertive okay. and okay. Uh, take on leadership roles where um, I was always doing singular sports, tennis, things like that, and, and kind of yeah. veered off and did parachute jumping, as you know. <laughs> okay. So I'm definitely a risk taker, but maybe on the extreme. Yeah, you're, you're definitely a risk taker. We don't have to worry about you. <laughs> but I, I think um, you're right. Uh, if you're not, uh, you know, the nurture nature concept, yeah. um, I think, again, those role models are so important. Okay. And I think I shared with you once before in the show that my father was my role model, but I didn't okay. have any other, per se, entrepreneurial role models until I got into college, okay. which... Um, it's unfortunate, but I think now young women have more role models that are online and starting their own businesses. So I think we're going to see that jump. Um, but again, I wish we'd gotten there a lot faster. So do you think it's just a pipeline issue then? Or are we just, you know, we are on the way to this. We just have to wait till more of these women from, you know, like you said, Title IX sports involvement, things like that. I mean, are we, are we on the way there or is it? That's a, that's a good, good, good point. I, I think we're on our way. But again, there might be a point where women say, I don't care if I don't go beyond 10 million. Yeah, yeah. So I always say lifestyle business, there's nothing wrong with the, you know, doing yeah, $10 million yeah, yeah. in revenue. Um, but again, um, it may not be every little girl's dream to uh, you know, do an IPO, but maybe to start a company. Yeah, okay. So that may take more time, or we may never see it go that direction. Maybe women are very satisfied in having that $10 million threshold. Uh, statistically, women um, maintain a business longer, a startup business okay. than males, maybe because they are a little less risk, -take you know, risk takers, and, and uh, maybe that's not a bad thing either. Well, it's interesting. Tim Draper at, at Draper University talks about if women are frustrated by the glass ceiling, you know, start your own business. That way you don't have to deal with, you know, men above you in the hierarchy. Right. So it would seem to have a tremendous amount of appeal. But is there something holding that back that we're not aware of or that we should be more aware of? Or? So interesting. All the women that went back for their MBA or in classes with me for graduate school, a lot of them went to the big accounting firms and okay. then dropped out because they didn't feel there was balance. Okay. So I see two things. Uh, either opportunity was lacking in the corporate environment, and so women wanted to grow and wanted to have their own vision, or they were lacking balance. So those are the two primary uh, drivers that I'm seeing. Uh, I'm not quite sure statistically, but again, uh, getting funding for women is still more difficult, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. No, that's no question about that. So the funding clearly produces its own version of glass ceiling for, uh, for entrepreneurs, the same that women experience in the corporate world. But... Um, it seems like we've got to do more here if we're going to really get more women entrepreneurs. There's got to be more promotion of the opportunity, more understanding of the risks, more understanding of how to overcome the risks. Um, and I think you mentioned team sports. I think just that whole concept of you don't need to be an entrepreneur by yourself. You can, you can do it as a team, um, and your survivability is higher. The, the fun, frankly, is higher, I think. Um, but clearly we've got to do something more than what we've been doing. I think it's great because you have the incubator. And uh, I, I see a lot of collaboration, and women have been uh, groomed to be collaborative. Okay. And so they don't need to be the person in charge, and they're very happy in a collaborative environment. So we might see more spinoffs where women are joining uh, an entrepreneurial group and then spin off on their own. Okay. And again, they don't have necessarily the drive to be the CEO. They're very happy in a support role, and they may still spin off and do their own. But I, I see that more. more well, the spin off's an interesting concept because I think a lot of people, uh, and this was the story with my wife and partner, 
she started in the corporate world, but got some experience under her belt, and then she was ready and hungry to go start her own business. But it wasn't like first off she wanted to do that. She wanted to work in an organization, experienced the frustration, but gained some skills and knowledge. And then when she launched, she was really ready to go and, and it's never looked back and really enjoyed the entrepreneur experience. But um, so is that the model? You know, get some experience under your belt and then launch or? I think pain is very important. <laughs> okay, and and uh, believe me, I'm not into pain, but I think that if, <laughs> if somebody experiences um, a not a good environment or they're not going where they yep, want to, yep. it's, uh, it's painful to realize that you're putting in all this time during the day and yep. you're not getting where you want to go. And what's so wonderful about this new generation, they have so much technology, they yep. can do quick research, they can see what's out there, and they can do things on the side where you and I, there was a time where we went to work and then we barely had enough time to get home, maybe we were going to school. Now you can do it during lunch hour. You can do research and work on your business plan online. So I think um, we're going to see folks that are going to start create kind of that side business. Okay. And I think that's very clever too. Well, you hit, I think the central feature though is pain, which is, so how do we help people cope with the pain? Because we know pain is going to be there whether you're an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, whatever you are, there's going to be pain. It's how you deal with it. So. Do you have a sense of there's a support group for it? Do you have a sense that there's maybe even a partner to work through it with? But most of our, you know, women guest speakers talked about resilience and the importance of hanging in there, utilizing resources to get through the pain because it's going to be there one way or the other. Mm -hmm. The question is, do you want to be more in charge of your own life or do you want to have to deal with somebody else over you? And I think that's, again, the advantage of being an entrepreneur is, you know, you get to sort of define your own pain, if you will. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I have several students that are uh, tolerating the pain while building okay. a business on the okay. side. And then we basically put a, kind of a benchmark of where they need to be for sales. Okay. And that's when they're going to push off. So I think it's so difficult for people that are just starting out. They want to buy a home. They want to start a family. Yep, yep. And so they have to learn to prioritize where do they want to be and how do they see themselves spending you know, all these hours. Okay. We're spending more time at work than we are with our loved ones. So yep. it's so important what we do. So clearly we've got a lot of work to do. So uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll come back and we can solve this problem more a bit later on. Count on me. Thank you very much, Dr. Deb. You've been watching Eye on Business Innovation, where our topic has been women and entrepreneurship. Hi, I'm John Kim co-founder of Lithium Cycles, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Eye on Business. Welcome, and I want to welcome John Kim. Great to see you, John. Nice to meet you. Okay. Uh, tell me about yourself. Tell me just a little about yourself anyway and how you got started with Lithium Cycles. Well, uh, my name again is John Kim. I'm the co-founder of Lithium Cycles. Uh, we build electric motorbikes. We're most famous for uh, the Super 73 electric motorbike. Um, we originally started in 2012 making industrial carts for you know, large warehouses, things like that. Last year, uh, we decided to enter into something less utilitarian, and so we went ahead and made an electric sort of mini bike. Um, we threw it on Kickstarter, and it was a huge hit. And ever since then, we've just been running with it, and it's, uh, it's become sort of... Um, uh, uh, the it product for millennials right now. Cool. Well, let me ask you about Kickstarter. Why did you decide to go with Kickstarter than, say, an angel group at that time? Well, Kickstarter is a really great tool for um, small startups. I mean, mainly because... And you uh, had an actual physical product, so you can actually, like, pre-sell them? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so what, what ended up happening was um, I sketched out the bike, um, and I built it over a weekend. The following day, um, I mean, the following weekend... Um, my business partner saw it. Everyone loved it. So we threw it on Kickstarter. The reason, the reason we threw it on Kickstarter was it's, Kickstarter has a lot of momentum. Yep. I mean, there's, uh, uh, it, it gets a lot of traffic from people who already have an appetite for products and are willing to pay in advance for them. So um, rather than you know, trying to go through these hurdles of, of trying to get angel investment or go through the VCs with just a prototype, we decided, well, let's throw it up on Kickstarter, get some pre-orders, see what it's, a, you know, see... Uh, what people think of it, and then just go from there. Well, we threw it on Kickstarter, and within 30 days, we had raised almost a half million dollars okay. in pre-sales. And um, just like I said, ever, ever since then, we've just been running with so, it. So that's pretty cool. Now, I, I think your bike is really an interesting bike, but 
you know, when I was growing up, I had a, uh, you know, like a fat boy, a Schwinn Phantom, mm -hmm. and it kind of reminds me of those thrilling days of yesteryear. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you come up with that design? Because I want to talk about the market for electric bikes and why your design will persevere. Okay, well, the, the main thing is, is that the bike, uh, we had inspiration from the mini bikes from the late 60s and through the 70s. Yeah, it makes you know? sense. And uh, those were the gas-powered mini bikes that, that were maybe powered with a, a, a lawnmower engine. Um, I grew up around that. My older brother had one. I'm a child of the 70s. And so, um, you know. So you're rubbing that in that I'm not? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate okay. it. <laughs> then, so we, uh, you know, we, we drew our inspiration from that. But, you know, with the little 12 inch wheels on a little mini bike, it really wasn't adult size. And so what we wanted to do was bring a modern version of that and to bring and to kind of tie into that nostalgia from that time period. And so that's really what the. Um, where the general design inspiration came from. But what we really wanted to do was we wanted something that sat between an electric bike and a motorcycle, electric right. motorcycle. And so what we've got now is, look, you know, the uh, most of the bicycle companies right now that are making a e-bikes or electric bikes are taking old pedal bicycles and then just electrifying them. But there's no reason that those things have to be shaped that way if for, you know, if you're just going to be powering, powering them through electricity. So what we did was we tried to pick the most comfortable form factor for someone who's just riding around town. Yeah. Let me so that's how we arrived. So at let that. me talk about riding around town. I had the privilege of getting on one of those bikes. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed of how fast I got it to go real fast. I think you were saying something like when I was on it and you were in the background with Aaron, one of your other co-founders, you were sort of screaming to put the brakes on, uh -huh, you know, yeah. how, but how really did I do as a novice riding one of those electric bikes? I think you did just fine. I, I didn't mean, crash. You didn't crash. I didn't crash. Yeah, no, and uh, <laughs> you look like you're going to crash. I look like it, really yeah. close. Um, no, it, you know, the, the current Super 73, which is our original model, is sort of high-powered. It's, it's built for speed and fun. Um, it's a great sort of exciting way to get around town. Um, and then since then, we've the, over the past month, we've launched two more models, which are, are more detuned, and they're more designed as an entry-level vehicle, so you won't run into that same problem. It's not really a problem because a lot, you know, most of our buyers want that that sort of high-powered ride, but there are some who want more of a um, a mellow sort of a, a gentler ride. And so we've launched two additional models to our product lineup that have you know that have an easier ride to them. Okay, so let's see. So your product. Uh, roadmap right now. You have a Super 73, which is mm -hmm. the high-end bike. Yeah. Uh, I believe you have Scout, which is a low-end. Mm -hmm. Do you have a lower-end bike, or do you have one in the middle? We have one in the middle. Uh, right now, we've launched a special edition called the Rose Ave, and that the sale of that was only for one month, but then it's now going to transition over to um, to just a different colored version of the Rose Ave called the, um, uh, it's just called the Scout S1. Oh, cool. And, um, and you know, it's it's basically technically very similar to the Rose Ave. It's just got a different color scheme, different sort of, uh, you know, seats and things like that. So you have the ability to sell different colors, different powers to different market segments, right? So you can do a Metro commuter. You can have one for college kids. Yeah. Well, which one would be good for a college kid? I have a gentleman coming in that's come in from Singapore, so we're, you know, <laughs> mucking around that I'm trying to convince him to buy one of your bikes. I would say the S1, the one right in the dead center. You know, um, the uh, the regular Scout is more for somebody on a budget, um, but the S1 sort of the sweet spot for your average person who may be in, in you know, in college. Um, you know, it, it's designed so that uh, it's got a good price point. You know, it retails for around sixteen hundred dollars. Um, if you, you know, that may sound steep, but for an e-bike, that's actually a really good value. Um, and if you look at a college campus where parking is very difficult, um, where the, the ownership of a car right. while you're on campus uh, may be next to impossible, um, you know, something like uh, the Scout S1 would be perfect for that. You know, you can get around town, you got a 40-mile range. So um, if you live in a college town, that's like the perfect okay. bike. All right. So we're, going to, we're running out of time, unfortunately, on this. I had a whole bunch of other questions. But let me ask you, your advice to a budding entrepreneur, mm -hmm. what are the three things that they should take note of or do to be successful? Uh, I think the most important thing that I've learned over the years um, is full commitment. Um, you know, some people may disagree with me, the, but uh, you basically have to go all in. Got it. So um, that's one. One. Second. Um, the second one is get the best team around you. Not your friends necessarily, but just people around you who are just as committed as you and who have um, 
reasonably strong talent in, in the different areas that you need to cover. So and three? Three is um, just uh, don't listen to everyone's opinions. You just basically at a certain point you have to you just have to go with your gut because you know chances are if you're starting a new business nobody else has ever done it before. Yeah. So who has the playbook? No one has a playbook because you're creating you know, effectively, if, to use a sports analogy, you're creating a new sport. Yeah. So I think it's great. I really appreciate you coming in, John, mm -hmm. and sharing some of the information about Lithium Cycles for our viewership. Check out lithiumcycles.com. Uh, great, great little bike crossover between an electric bike and a motorcycle. Uh, enjoy it and talk to John about potential discounts. I'm just kidding. I can't make that. Don't don't yeah. take it out of my pocket. John, right, great to you. see you. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Thank you and good evening.